This is Wrong Sports, and this is Discontinued Episode 3. In the previous episodes of Discontinued, I went over college football programs that are no longer playing like the NYU football program, or college football programs that are no longer playing in their original form, like the Chicago Maroons football program in Episode 2. This week, however, I'll be going over a college football program that's been discontinued a couple of times. Though they have a few really great teams, they have a legendary coach and a player that you may not have heard about, but he was quite legendary in his time. This is the story of the University of Detroit and the Detroit Titans football program. But before I get to the rise and fall of the Detroit Titans football program, make sure you like this video, make sure you share this video, and of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Please ring the bell so you know when I'm putting out new videos. And as always, make sure you follow me on Twitter at SportsWrong so you can keep up on when I'm releasing new videos. The University of Detroit is actually called the University of Detroit Mercy and can be traced back to 1877 with the founding and creation of Detroit College. The school was founded and led by the Catholic Church in the city and was a small school only becoming a university in 1911. After that, they expanded to a second campus in the city in 1927 and opened the Mercy College of Detroit in 1941. They currently have three campuses in the city of Detroit and cover 91 acres, but even though they are a large school by size, their endowment is not that big. It's only $71.9 million. And I bring that up because like in my other discontinued videos, I tend to mention the culprit for a team going away, and the financial situation is just that for the University of Detroit football program going away. The Detroit football program started in 1896 with a professor at Detroit, William Robeson, becoming the first official coach. Robeson was a former player in college at St. Louis, another program I will be talking about for this series. But Robeson helped this first ragtag squad through a seven-game season where they faced athletic teams, two games versus high school squads, and their only intercollegiate game, which was versus Loyola University of Chicago, which they lost 20 to nothing. Their final record in the seven-game schedule was five and two, and Robeson would actually keep the winning ways going for this team over the next four seasons, leading them until 1900, and he went 16 and four, but again, most of these wins were against high school programs, or athletic clubs, or much smaller programs. When the 20th century started, the school hired their first paid coach, and William J. Ryan, who was paid $100 a season and went 500, but they did play more non-high school teams, as well as also played Michigan Agriculture Cultural College, known as Michigan State in 1902, where they also lost 11 to nothing. But the school was looking to keep the momentum going, as they would hire their first alumni as coach in 1903 with the hire of W. Alfred Debo. He was a player on their 1896 squad, and Detroit College would go 3-4 in 1903 under Debo, but they played more colleges and also added another Michigan school in Michigan State Normal, or Eastern Michigan as they are known of now, and they played them twice going 1-1. One and one. But just as the team was starting to play more colleges and also play more in general, they started to show their major flaw, money issues. The team didn't have practice gear, so players brought their own. They didn't have a home field or even a real practice field. Plus, to go along with that, the school didn't really want to keep paying for it, since it was becoming costly with the injuries that occurred during the games as well. Unfortunately for the team, the school picked a terrible time to bring this up to them, as they just finished winning their first game of the 1905 season, and before they could travel to Game 2, the college president shut down the team for the rest of the season, citing, This game is too rough. But financial issues would eventually be the reason for the school giving up on the team, but that was remedied pretty quickly during the summer of 1906 as students brought up the idea of bringing back the team. Eventually, the team was brought back, but only if the Athletic Association could cover the cost of the team. The 1906 season would start with Edward J. Bryan back on the sideline, and the team would play seven games with five versus high school teams and two versus colleges, as they would play Michigan State Normal and Adrian College, which they lost and tied to in respective games. The team went 4-2-1 in the season, and they played their last game versus a high school team at Bennett Park, which was where the Tigers played, and it held 5,000 people at least. 
For the Detroit Titans game, though, it only drew a thousand, so it wasn't looking good for the Athletic Association breaking even on this investment. For the 1907 season, former player George A. Kelly was hired for head coach. The team played three colleges this year and went one and three, and the team didn't play in 1908, and I'm not sure why, but having the team only play four games in 1907 might have been an edict from the school to play less so there were less injuries. And also, maybe if they played less games, there would be less overhead for the Athletic Association to pay for. The team was back in 1909 with Kelly back at coach, and at QB was Gerald Kelly. No relation, I don't think, but I was confused too when I was looking up articles on the team. Anyway, Kelly at quarterback helped the team go 3-1-2 in 1909, including a last-second game-winning kick in the final game over Michigan State Normal. George A. Kelly would win three games in 1910 before stepping down before 1911. The school would hire the basketball coach this year. His name was Royal R. Campbell to take over. And along with that, the school finally became the University of Detroit. With university status, it also brought them less high school teams to play, and they would play six colleges in 1911, going two and six over that year. But they would go through some big changes coming up in 1917. Before the season, the school announced that Gil Doby was going to be their new head coach. Doby was 58-0-3 during his first 11 seasons. Doby was promised that he would be able to coach the team just for a few months so that he would be able to work other jobs that he had. Doby came to campus and started to work with the team, and also managed to do something no other coach could do for the Titans, and that was schedule a game versus Michigan. Doby got the team ready for the season through the summer, but just before September, Doby left and would quickly accept the head coaching job at Navy. With the season starting in about five weeks, Detroit went out and had to hire a local high school coach, his name James F. Duffy, to coach. Duffy got the team ready after this late change, and they were actually starting hot as they destroyed Toledo in Toledo's first game, as they beat him 145 to nothing. Then Detroit traveled to Ann Arbor to play the University of Michigan and fielding H. Yost. The team hung in the game, and it wasn't a blowout, but they didn't get in the end zone as they lost 14-3. The Detroit Titans didn't lose for the rest of the season, and they ended it 8-1. But after that great way to end the season, war was underway, and in an interesting coincidence, Duffy would leave the team to join the Navy, just like Dobie did. The 1918 team only played two games, and they lost them both, before coming back next season after the war was over with a full team, and Duffy was back at coach again. The 1919 season started with three bigger games scheduled versus Eastern teams like Tufts, Georgetown, and Holy Cross. This was a way for Coach Duffy to see how his team was going to fare versus Eastern colleges, which were still considered the best at this time. The 1919 team also had some early NFL talent in Tilly Voss. He played for a few NFL teams, including the Chicago Bears, as well as Walt Clago and Tip O'Neill. With the talent they had and Duffy coaching, they went 8-1, only losing to Tufts 7-3 after Detroit drove down in the final seconds but came up short on an incomplete pass in the end zone. The great record resulted in 10,000 fans showing up for most of their home games, and this was seen in the next few years as well. The 1921 season was their next big year, as Duffy was still coaching and led the team to their best start, 8-0, including wins over Boston College in Boston as they shut them out 28 to nothing. Their final game was versus Washington and Jefferson. Washington and Jefferson were undefeated as well, but over Eastern powers like Syracuse, West Virginia, and Pitt. Also, Washington and Jefferson were looking to cement their undefeated season as well as accept an invite to the Rose Bowl. The game drew Detroit's biggest crowd of 22,000 fans, but Detroit couldn't get in the end zone, and they didn't get shut out either, though they lost 14-2, ending their season 8-1. Washington and Jefferson ended up going to the Rose Bowl and tying California, so they kept their unbeaten season. Duffy would coach Detroit through the 1924 season, with the exception being 1923, and I'll explain that in a moment. And winning seven of eight games each of the season, he was in Detroit. His final year was 1924, where he had a losing record. Now, the reason why Duffy didn't coach in 1923 was because he planned to retire after 1922 so that he could practice at a law firm. That only lasted about a year or so before he came back towards the end of 1923 and would coach the 1924 season. After Duffy left Detroit, Detroit would go out to find a big name coach, kind of like they did a few years ago where they tried to hire Gil Doby, as Detroit would go out and hire Notre Dame great Gus Doré. 
Gus Duray was an assistant at Notre Dame and then became the coach of Gonzaga in 1920. He would do wonders for them out west, with winning records every year and also making a lot of money for the university, as he would raise $7,000 in his final 1924 season, which was a huge way he would get paid to be the coach. The University of Detroit saw DeRay not only as a good coach, but also he could help fund a football and athletic program. So he was given full authority not only over the football program, but also over the entire athletic program. DeRay started his career at Detroit going 5-4 in 1925 before having a losing record in 1926. During these years at Detroit, they played some big teams like Army, St. Louis, and Georgetown. And these two seasons also helped DeRay get used to this new school and also find some great talent as DeRay would find his best talent for the 1927-1928 season in running back and pretty much guy who could do everything on the field, Lloyd Brazil. Now, if you have seen my video on great underrated teams of the 1920s, then you may know a little bit about Brazil. But if you don't know about him, I recommend you watch the video. I'll put a link about it above, but I'll give you a little bit about Brazil right now. He was a native Michigander out of Bay City and starred in high school in the city of Flint. Now, Brazil didn't play until 1927, but once DeRay got a look of him, he made him pretty much the entire offense. Brazil averaged eight yards a carry over the 1927, through 1929 seasons at Detroit, and the Detroit football team won 23-3-1. In 1927, Brazil showed off not only his running ability, but also his passing skills. Now, while I don't have all the stats, he does come up in several news articles at the time, completing long passes down the field. Not many for touchdowns, but still, completing long passes down the field were pretty big news stories then. The team also played a pretty tough schedule as they played Army and Notre Dame this season, only losing by six points to Army before getting shut out to Notre Dame. Brazil would help the team go 7-2, and two, and DeRay would say that without Brazil playing, he would still be the best player on the field. So that shows just how highly DeRay thought of Brazil. Also, Brazil was such a good athlete, not only on the gridiron, but also he played basketball and baseball at Detroit, so this guy was pretty much playing a sport year-round at the school. Anyway though, I talked about the 1928 team in my previous video, and I'll link that above, but the team went undefeated that year, the only Midwestern school to do that, but they didn't play Notre Dame this year or Army, but their schedules still had Louisville, Georgetown, Tulsa, Michigan State, and Fordham. But the real story this year was Lloyd Brazil, as he got all the press for the team as he led the nation in passing with nearly 1,000 yards. He had 997 passing yards. He also had 1,117 rushing yards. He wasn't the point leader or even the rushing leader this season due to an NYU running back I talked about in my previous discontinued video. But still, Brazil did something that NYU couldn't do, and that was go undefeated that season. So it's a pretty big accomplishment for him. And 1929 would be a continuation of winning ways for DeRay and Brazil as they started 4-0 with all of their games at home. They drew over 15,000 fans or more for every one of these games. They would tie Marquette in their fifth game, but then they went on the road to beat West Virginia and Michigan State behind a scary aerial attack with not only Brazil throwing and running, but also catching passes. So Detroit were now 6-0-1 and they were coming home to play Oregon State. And unfortunately, Oregon State stopped Brazil most of the game, and Brazil would also get injured during this game, resulting in Detroit's first loss of the season. Brazil also didn't play in the season finale, but it didn't matter because Detroit still won to end their season 7-1-1. Going into the 1930s, there was a big boom happening in Detroit with plenty of factories and people and good athletes coming to the city. Plus, DeRay was still running the program and had his star player Brazil as his assistant, and he was also coaching baseball and basketball. So DeRay knew that he could still build this program and he could build it pretty fast. Unfortunately though, Brazil was coaching, so he couldn't play anymore. So the teams for DeRay weren't as good as they were the years previous, but they still had winning records to kick off the 1930s, as they went 5-3-2 and two, playing some bigger teams like Iowa, Michigan State, and Fordham in 1930, and they would improve to seven wins in 1931, and an 8-2 record in 1932, including getting a win over Oregon State. In 1933, DeRay used his aerial attack again to go almost undefeated and also set a new passing mark as his quarterback, Doug Knott, passed for 1,092 yards. 
the team went 7-1 and one with their only loss coming to Duquesne in Pittsburgh, where they were shut out and only completed four passes, with two of them getting intercepted. The team was still good in 1934, but not was the only good player it seemed because they couldn't win seven games again as they stayed above 500 with a 5-3-1 record. Unfortunately, Knott would run into some educational trouble as he would miss a lot of classes during the 1934 season and was kicked off campus. So you would think this would start a little decline, but it didn't really happen yet as the team got a little bit better in the late 1930s. 1937 was their next great season for them, as they started 5-0, shutting out all five of those teams, so they were ranked in the top 25 for the first time. They couldn't keep the ranking though, as they ended the season 7-3. DeRay continued to teach his passing attack and play all teams all over the country now, as he would yearly play one or two NYC teams, and also started to play teams out west, as the Titans traveled to Sacramento in 1938 to play Santa Clara, who were also ranked at the time. And they will also be a team I will talk about in Discontinued, so stay tuned for that. But to cap off the 1930s, in 1939, they went 5-3 and three before a season-ending game in Pittsburgh versus Duquesne, who were undefeated, and they also beat Pittsburgh earlier in the season. So this was a pretty big game for Duquesne as they wanted to keep their undefeated streak going and also Detroit wanted to get a little bit of payback and they got a little bit as they tied them 10 to 10 to ruin Duquesne's undefeated season and also give Detroit and DeRay something good to end the decade on. To start the 1940s, DeRay was in his 16th year now at Detroit and he would have his most explosive team yet. The team this year led the Midwest, this includes the Western Conference or the Big Ten, in total offense, rushing attack, as well as total defense. The team was led by Al Gasquier, who had 956 yards, which was more than the Heisman winner that season Tom Harmon had. But even with those great stats, the team couldn't go undefeated as they went 7-2, losing in a close game over Tulsa and also DeRay's former team, Gonzaga. The team was gaining stride in college football circles circles, as teams all around the country wanted to play Detroit and also play them in Detroit. And along with that, they were also drawing lots of fans, as they had six home games in 1940 and drew over 15,000 fans in four of them. In 1941, they made the schedule better with a game at home versus Arkansas, and then going on the road to play University of Indiana and Oklahoma State. They would beat Indiana and Oklahoma State, but lose at home to Arkansas to end their season 7-2, and two, and they also drew over 30,000 fans for that Arkansas game. A big reason for their success besides their aerial attack over the last few seasons was their All-American center, Vince Bononis. He was credited for calling and also diagnosing plays, which helped to keep their success going. When the 1942 season started, DeRay was still the coach of the team, and this would be his final year coaching the team. He just didn't know it yet. The team played a majority of their games at home, but they did travel to New York City and also San Francisco to play Manhattan and St. Mary's respectively. The team went 5-4, and four, with their final game happening in San Francisco just one day before the attack on Pearl Harbor. With World War II starting soon, and after that most college-age men going to war, it spelled the postponement of sports on the campus of Detroit. With the war starting and sports shuttering, Doreas would also leave the university and head to the NFL to coach the Detroit Lions from 1943 to 1947. He didn't have the same success he had in college as he went 20, 31, and 2 in his five seasons with his best finish of second in the division. But towards the end of summer of 1945, Detroit and their new athletic director, Lloyd Brazil, were looking to restart the football program. Now you would think Brazil would take the role, but he was already athletic director, also he ran the baseball program and the basketball program, as well as being the business manager. Plus he was also the backfield coach for the football team, so he was busy enough to want to coach another team. So Brazil went out and hired a former Illinois great in Chuck Bear. Bear played on an undefeated and national title winning team, and he did block for a Grange, but it wasn't Red Grange, it was actually Red's younger brother Garland Grange. 
Bear got to work quickly and the football team was going to be ready for their schedule that they saw before war. As they played most of their schedule from teams out of the Midwest, but they did play Mississippi State, who they lost to, and Bear's first team went 6-3. and three. So the winning ways continued, but they loved winning six games in a season every year. And the next year with the war over, and most college-age men coming back on campus, the talent was also getting better, and Detroit still had a winning record, but again, they won six games. And they traveled to all sides of the United States, as they went to Massachusetts to play Holy Cross, which they lost. Then they traveled to California, to San Francisco to play the University of San Francisco where they won, and then they ended the season going to Florida to play Miami for the first time and lose to them. But one final positive note for the season was a mid-October game over Tulsa. Tulsa was ranked at the time, and Detroit would upset them, giving Tulsa their only loss on the season, and it would also continue a little mini rivalry they had with Tulsa that would continue in the following years. Their record stayed the same in 1947, but they did play a new team in Oklahoma who were coached by first-year head coach Bud Wilkerson. Detroit would lose to Oklahoma, but they would end up winning six games again. They did that again in 1948. But after that 1948 season of winning six games, there would be a big change for them coming as Detroit would enter the Missouri Valley Conference in 1949. Now, the entering of the Missouri Valley Conference was pretty good luck for Detroit because they declined to a 5-4 and four record, but they went 4-0 and oh in the Missouri Valley Conference, so they won their first conference title. So even though it broke their streak of winning six games, they still managed to get a conference title out of the deal. The 1950s saw some shakeups, and it started in the 1950s season. Clark was a star for Colorado College in 1928, and he was also an All-American. He also played in the NFL for the Detroit Lions, and he was in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and in the College Football Hall of Fame and was coming in to take over for Lloyd Brazil, who was starting to do less at the university, and more on that in just a moment. The 1950 season, though, finished with another six-win season, as they were 6-3-1, and one, and they came in second in the Missouri Valley Conference. After the season, though, Coach Bear would step down from being the coach, citing changes at the university and in the athletic staff. One of those big changes was that Brazil was not going to be the athletic director anymore, but he would remain at the university as the baseball coach, and he did that until his death about a decade later. And the university didn't take long to promote Dutch Clark to be their head coach and also to be their athletic director, and he would sign a contract to do that for the next four seasons. But all of the changes caused this program to hit a wall, not only on the field, but also in the stands. Clark's first year, 1951, saw the team play three home games all before October 6th with that final one against Notre Dame, who were ranked number six at the time, and they would lose pretty badly, 40 to six. The game was being played at Briggs Stadium in Detroit, which is where the Detroit Tigers played, because the Detroit University didn't have a big enough stadium for this game. And they really kind of needed it since this game drew over 52,000 fans and the Detroit Stadium on campus could barely hold 35,000. That was with their overflow because the stadium could comfortably hold 25,000. The team ended 1951 with four wins, and then in 1952 they decreased to three wins, but they did have a noteworthy player on the field. His name was Ted Marshabrota. He played mostly at quarterback, and he also led the team in passing yards, as well as led the nation in total offense with over 1,800 total yards. The next season, they did not have Ted Marsha Broda, but they still had Clark coaching, and he coached them to a 6-4 and four record, including being a co-champion of the Missouri Valley Conference. The crowds averaged 15,000 fans that season, but as the season went on and the weather got colder, the crowd dwindled, and this started to be a trend that I started to notice, where all of their games that they had at home in September and October were starting to draw pretty well, but if they ever had a November game, it drew under 10,000 fans, or most of the time I couldn't even find attendance stats for those games. After the 1953 season, Dutch Clark would let his contract expire and he would leave the University of Detroit. He left on a high note, though, as the team were co-champions of the Missouri Valley Conference. 
the team wouldn't look far again for their next coach as they hired another assistant, Wally Fromhart, to be the head coach. But a difference here was that Fromhart was only hired here to be the coach and not be the athletic director. Fromhart had a trying year in 1954 as they won two and seven, and along with that, they did have six home games all before Halloween, with one drawing over 20,000 fans and three home games having under 10,000 fans, with one of them having under 5,000 fans, and that was one right around Halloween. The team would drastically improve in 1955 as they started one and three before finishing unbeaten and be the co-champions of the Missouri Valley Conference. And because the team was winning, they also managed to draw more fans to their games this year, as all of their home games had over 10,000 fans, including a rare November home game versus Villanova, which had a reported 14,350 fans in attendance. This was one of the only few November home games that I could find that had an attendance over 10,000. From Hart was building on last year, and he opened up the 1956 season with a win over Marquette at home with over 12,000 fans. But after that, the team struggled to a 1-8 finish and just barely averaging over 10,000 fans for the season for their five home games. And again, remember, most of the money they made was from these home games. The 1958 season drew a big change for Fromm Hart and the football team as they left the Missouri Valley Conference and were going to be independent. I'm not sure for the reason for them leaving, but Oklahoma State did leave for the Big 8 in 1956, and there were a lot of changes in the Missouri Valley Conference in the early 1950s due to several on-field incidents, but Detroit also could have left due to them wanting to be an independent again as it also allowed them to schedule more teams like them as they would schedule more Catholic schools, more private schools, and it was also another hint that the school was scaling back on the budget for this team. They ended up being 4-4-1 four, four in 1958 with playing new teams like Arizona State and Air Force. At the end of this year, Fromm Hart would leave and the school would hire former player from Purdue, Jim Miller, who was also a player under Paul Brown when Brown was an Ohio high school coach. Miller came in and had a talented team with six future NFL players playing during the 1959 season. Bruce Marr was the best of the six as he led the team in rushing and scoring, and the team went six and four. Marr would leave after the season to go to the NFL and play for the Detroit Lions and the New York Giants through the 1960s. 1960 would be another really good season for the team, but they just couldn't make it all work to have them have a great season. They started off with a loss to Iowa State at home, but after that they went on a seven-game winning streak before going to East Lansing to play Michigan State. Michigan State took it to them early with a 15-0 lead before Detroit came back to tie it at 15, but Michigan State would score four more times to end this game, 43-15. That loss left Detroit 7-2, but they finally got over the six-win hump for once, which was good, and it also showed that their independent schedule still allowed them to play some pretty big teams and also stay competitive. The 1961 season started great as they were 3-0 and they played them all at home before playing Navy at home. Navy were coming off of an Orange Bowl appearance the previous year, and they also had a Heisman winner as well. They didn't have him this year, and Detroit hung in the game most of the way before suffering their first loss to Navy, 37-19. But even though they did lose, they did hang in the game for a while, and they did have 31,000 fans in attendance, so that might have also helped them out too. The schedule will get really hard for Detroit too, as they played Army two weeks after Navy and lost to Army as well, finishing the season with back-to-back -back road losses to Cincinnati and Arizona State as they limped to a 5-4 and four finish. Jim Miller would leave Detroit after 1961 to coach at Boston College and have a pretty great career there. So Detroit once again had to go out and look for a new coach. And again, they didn't look very far for their new coach as they promoted their backfield coach to head coach. His name was John Itzik. If you are a New York Jet fan, then you might know the name Itzik as John Jr. would be the GM of the Jets and be pretty bad in that role. But anyway, John Itzik Sr. was named as the head coach of the University of Detroit before the 1962 season. Itzik accepted the job, but not before he was told by higher-ups that if the school didn't improve at the box office, then the school would have to disband. Now, Itzik would move on with that knowledge as he got his team ready, but it didn't go well for them this 
season, as they would start off playing against Boston College and facing off against their former head coach at home in front of 22,000 fans, which again, this is a pretty big game if there's more than 15,000 fans. Boston College would show up for this game and Detroit pretty much could do nothing against them as they were shut out 27 to nothing and they would lose their first six games of the season before winning only one game and ending the season with their worst record in the last four decades as they went 1-8. and eight. Their worst record since then was when they went 0-2 during a World War II shortened season in 1918. It did get a little better for them even though their offensive numbers fell as they didn't have a 1,000 yard passer in 1963 and 1964, and they would finish with two wins in 1963 and then a three-win season in 1964, so they were slowly getting better under Itzik. The wins may have increased, but it didn't help them as they finished the season on the road in Boston College to play their old coach Jim Miller, and they lost to them, but it was pretty close, 17-9. It was then announced less than a week and a half after that final game that the team was finished and they would be disbanded. Now, that seems like a shocking way to end. Yeah, it was shocking to pretty much everyone who was on the football team, football coaches, and also alumni were pretty mad that they weren't talked to, as the alumni had a club that was started by DeRay, and it raised as much as $20,000 a year for the team, and they said they could do more if the school needed them to. The university would come out, though, and say that the team was losing money ever since 1951, and they were losing as much as $65,000 a year from that point. Now, I'm not sure the exact amount they were losing in 1951, but the university has stated that the team lost $65,000 in 1964 alone. The student body would protest during the spring, but it didn't do all that much for a while. More on that in a second. The head coach of the team, John Itzig, was now out of a job, out of nowhere pretty much, and sued the university for shuttering the team without his knowledge, and without telling him how much in debt the team was. Itzik later left the school and became an NFL backfield and offensive coordinator for decades, but it would later come out that Itzik was in for way too much when he took over to be the head coach at the school, because he was now the director of football. This was because the athletic department was pretty much run on a part-time basis, and the coaches of each sport were the director of that sport, meaning they pretty much had to do everything associated with running that sport. That means that not only did they have to coach, and also recruit players and train those players, but they also had to do scheduling, they had to figure out travel for the teams, uniforms, pretty much everything, and unless Itzik could form his own staff, which he really couldn't do in that short amount of time, he pretty much had to do everything on his own, and he just, he just couldn't do it. It's pretty much, it's too hard for any one person to do that many jobs. He also had to stay under a budget, and also somehow make money for the school, which was something that, uh, yeah, wasn't really possible. It was also hard because they weren't drawing huge numbers in the stands, with their only big games coming against Notre Dame, which they had to play at the Detroit Tiger Stadium, and their last game of having over 25,000 fans in attendance was that 1961 game versus Navy, but the team lost most of their money scheduling and playing that game, and we eventually found out about that years later. And that also might have been a reason why Detroit didn't really schedule too many big names to come to Detroit, because they weren't making enough money for that to happen. In their final season of 1964, they drew an average of 13,000 fans for their first four home games, before their final game was in front of 8,000 fans. It was also starting to be noticeable that the team wasn't able to draw more than 15,000 fans in November, like I mentioned, and you can notice this all the way back to when DeRay was the coach in the late 1920s and 30s. That was why DeRay scheduled a lot of away games at the end of the season, as he knew he couldn't draw big crowds to come to his home games in November, because in case you didn't know, Michigan winters start around Halloween and they're pretty cold. Also, they could only draw 30,000 fans or more if they were playing big name teams, but they weren't big enough to schedule and also compete with the big name independent schools every year. And that was also what the school needed to do to make more money, because bigger schools equal big gate money. But again, it was becoming hard for them because they weren't making any money on these big name teams coming to campus, and they also couldn't do a nine game schedule at home against big name opponents. It just wasn't 
impossible. After DeRay left and World War II was over, University of Detroit still scheduled these big teams like Michigan State, Army, Navy, Notre Dame, and couldn't win in any of them either. That was also an issue, was that they couldn't beat any of these big name teams. Most if not all of Detroit's wins after 1959 were against teams that either don't play football anymore or are now in the FCS, as the only two teams that they have beaten during that time that are now presently in the FBS are their wins over Boston College and when they beat Western Michigan. But after the 1964 season, the Detroit Titans football team wasn't coming back, at least in their old form. Due to student protest, the school started to look into fielding a new team, but it was going to be at the club level. This was basically the school spending nothing, as if there were no scholarships and really like no uniforms, no practice, pretty much what they did back in the old day. They were going to try to say, hey, let's do that again. Let's not spend any money on this football team. And they did that, and the team was actually pretty good. They were ranked nationally in the club level, and they did start to schedule D3 schools in the 1970 and 71 season, but they lost to them badly. And no more than a year after that, they would end playing club football. So along with not having football altogether, they also didn't have a football stadium because their old stadium wasn't around anymore. It actually closed in 1964 after the football team stopped playing there. It was repurposed for a bit in the mid-1960s for a semi-pro soccer team, and the final American football game that was played at the stadium was by the Michigan Arrows of the Continental Football League. That happened in 1968, and that didn't draw more than 5,000 fans for a game. The stadium would be demolished in 1971, and it was replaced by a parking lot, which is fitting, I guess. But the Detroit football team wasn't half bad, as they had a 308, 204, and 28 record, and never finished with a winless record in their last 50 years. They do have that 0-2 record, but I don't really count that because that was during that war-shortened year. The school does have something in common with my former discontinued episode, the Chicago Maroons, as Detroit does claim a share of the national title in 1928. They also have dozens of NFL players, legendary coaches. So this story of the Detroit Titans football program pretty much just came down to money, a little bit of fan support, but mostly they just didn't have the money and nor did they have the school that was willing to spend money on them. And that's pretty much what will make or break any college football program or any college program in general nowadays. But anyway, I hope you liked this episode. Make sure you like, make sure you share this video. Of course, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Please ring the bell as well. Leave me a comment on this video. Tell me what you like, what you didn't like. And also uh, tell me what else uh, you think I should be covering in this series or what other college football programs, college football teams, years. What else do you think I should be covering in Wrong Sports? And as always, find me on Twitter at SportsWronged and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thanks a lot, guys.